Hello and welcome to the Craft Beer Corner. For today's beer review, we're jumping into a couple of lighter, more hop dominant beers. And specifically, we're talking IPA, that should come as no surprise, but also American Pale Ale. Um, we'll get into that in a minute, but that's what we're gonna be jumping into. Um, one of these is from a brewer we've had quite a few beers from, um, have really good experience with them. One is brand new to me, so also gonna be exciting. So it's gonna be a little bit of a compare and contrast, but beers that are related. Uh, so we're gonna start with brew, uh, Barrier Brewing Company's Deadly Combination. This is part of their uh, new uh, two hop rotating IPA series. This one's specifically brewed with Mosaic and Strata hops. Clocks in at 7.4% ABV. Barrier Brewing Company is based in Oceanside, New York. Now for the new brewer to me. This is Dancing Gnome called Inner Earth. This is an American Pale Ale, clocks in at even higher than the first one at 8% ABV. Dancing Gnome is based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we've got a couple of beers. One the really hop forward version of it and one the standard style by which the India version, the hopped up version has been created. So it's been a while since I've did one, done one of these where I've had a couple styles that are related but contrasting and just kind of digging into the differences. So we're gonna be doing individual reviews on both of these beers, but we will be talking about the distinct differences between the styles and their commonalities. So always exciting and always exciting to jump into new beers and certainly a new brewer. So we're gonna get things kicked off, starting with Barrier Brewing Company's Deadly Combination. This one clocks in at 7.4% ABV. Okay, so jumping right into the first beer of today's lighter hop forward beer review. We have got the IPA of the bunch. This is Barrier Brewing Company's Deadly Combination. It is part of their new two hop rotating series of IPAs. Uh, this one's specifically brewed with Mosaic and Strata hops. Clocks in at 7.4% ABV. Barrier Brewing is based in Oceanside, New York. So first things first, starting with label art, it's a very clean, simple design. It's got a very dark kind of forest green colored label. It's got a couple of weird looking hops and kind of a paint splatter. That's what it looks like. Nice little design. Nothing else to talk about there. So we're gonna get this cracked. And today we are using our handy dandy kind of all purpose Sam Adams glasses, which really do work quite well for pretty much all beer styles. So we're gonna get this poured right in. It's only a 12 ounce glass. We will not get this entire pint in here. Okay, I'm going to have to be a bit more gentle. This one really is wanting to form a crazy, crazy head here. And uh, while that is desired, we do need more of the base beer in than the head. So I am just tilting this a little greater and pouring a little slower than I typically would, but that's okay. Um, the fact that we can already out of the gate see that it's going to form a nice head is not a bad thing for my money but I would like to at least get halfway up this tulip if I could to let the glass do its thing. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about, aside from this incredible head that it obviously created, it's just the pungency of aroma. I, as soon as I cracked this and started pouring, the hop aromas are really bursting forth. Mosaic and Strata, that's an interesting combination. They're both uh, newer hops to come on the scene and they're both used a lot uh, these days, and that's a good thing. So sure, everybody knows about Mosaic. It does put off aromas and flavors of blueberry. That's present here. Strata, well, maybe not quite as common as Mosaic these days, but it um, kind of reminds me a bit of a few different beer, uh, beers, a bit of a few different hops. So think of a Citra that is coupled with perhaps Elements of a Simcoe and elements of a Fuggle, but still high alpha acid content. So it puts off the citrusy aromas, underlying tropical, tropical aromas, same thing on the flavor pro profile, a little bit of earthiness and some underlying kind of resin notes. And all of that's coming through quite clearly in this beer. Indeed, the dominant is these combination of citrus and tropical aromas I'm getting you can smell that underlying blueberry characteristic from the mosaic. It really does smell quite nice. Really lovely, quite bold, quite pungent. Visually, this one is a hazy IPA. Nothing wrong with that. And they chose a couple of good hops. So it'll be interesting to see if this one's all kind of aroma forward, 
flavor forward or if they added a bunch to extract base alphas. You never really know getting into a hazy. But we're going to jump right in, find out. The head has settled down a bit, but it's still just absolutely lush. I mean, that is, that is just a picture-perfect head floating on top of this IPA. Let's dive right in, messing the beard aside. Mm, that's a very nice IPA. It's very, very flavorful. That I will tell you. What I will also tell you is that it is not particularly bitter dominant. It's kind of what I expect from a hazy. Every once in a while I'm surprised, but this is kind of prototypical because they follow that New England style. It's to get tons of hop aroma and tons of hop flavor extracted into the beer but typically backs off on the bitters so that the hop aroma and flavor profiles can kind of do their thing without the bitter sensation overriding it. So is it my preferred sub style of IPA? No, it's not. Do I still appreciate it for what it is? Yes, I do. Do I still think that they're tasty? You betcha I do because hops are absolutely delicious. So let's dive into this one. We already talked about the aroma. How does the flavor present itself? Well, as soon as you start to swish around the palate, you're really picking up tons of citrus and tropical fruit notes. This one most dominantly reminds me of a cross between lemon and papaya. There's a slight suggestion of grapefruit in there. There was a slight suggestion of pineapple in there and maybe even the slightest suggestion of orange in there. There are some underlying slight earthy notes to it. There is a slight bit of underlying resinous quality to it, but it's really, really minute and is very much in the background of the tropical and the citrus dominant flavor profiles that are coming through. Bitters, very, very mild, very, very subdued. I think this is probably going to be a really good kind of where we talk about the differences comparison to the American Pale Ale. In fact, if I were a betting man before I jump into it, I would bet money that the standard American Pale Ale is going to be more hop dominant than this hazy IPA. Uh, but we'll get into that when we get to it. Not that this is a competition, but since we're comparing light hop dominant styles, this is a good place to talk about uh, kind of these differences. Historically, IPAs were born out of taking an American Pale Ale, excuse me, not an American Pale Ale, a standard Pale Ale that originated in the UK, and then adding additional hops. It helps to preserve beer. That is the dominant function of a hop. The side shoot of doing that is that you add in more hops. Depending on where and how you do them, it's going to extract more base alpha acids, which are responsible for the bittering of the beer. It's also naturally going to put in more aroma profile just by extra abundance of hops, even more so if you dry hop, which extracts far more aroma and flavor compounds but backs off and keeps the alpha acids from getting worked into it. It requires temperature. That's why you, if you want a hoppy bit beer, you're going to add more hops into the boil. The higher alpha acid content, the better. That's where they get extracted to bitter the beer. On the back end, when the beer is already done and you're dry hopping or you're adding in additional hops at the lower temperatures, it's going to bring in more hop characteristic flavor, but it's not going to add that additional bitterness. There's still a little bit that will happen, but by and large, it's going for more flavor and or aroma compounds. So that's what happened here. And this is a very typical hazy. So it is absolutely packed full of aroma. It's packed full of flavor, but the bitters are not in the way. So it's really letting the hop characteristics talk without the addition of that bitter characteristic, which most people associate with hops. So really quite tasty, very multi-layered, tons of intricacy happening in terms of aroma and flavor, and it is indeed positively delicious. It's just not particularly bitter forward at all. I've had Pilsners that are far more bitter than this beer. So I'm gonna jump back in, think a bit more on this flavor development, how it finishes out, and uh, certainly the body and the mouthfeel, and uh, we'll, we'll see what else there's in store. Mm. Oh, it's so good. Body and mouthfeel. The body feels maybe slightly 
more robust than I would expect on a 7.4% IPA, but I would say it's near as perfection as you could get. Mouthfeel, similar story here. It's got a little bit more thickness, a little bit more resistance than I would expect for 7.4. Again, for my money, I would call that perfection. In terms of what happens when you agitate around the palate, this one does get quite a bit thicker in composition, quite a bit creamier. Not silkier, but creamier and thicker. So there's a lot happening, happening texturally. In terms of the finish, the finish is relatively short. It's quite crisp. It's, um, uh, in terms of flavor, it's not dry. I don't mean a dry crispness. We're not talking about a goza finish here or a dry stout finish here. It's actually quite wet to the end, but the way that uh, the flavor profile develops and finishes off is quite clean. It's succinct, that's the best way I could put it. So there's a big burst of ripe, fresh flavor with a ton of interactivity of flavors mishmashing and happening, a ton of complexity, but it's a very quick ride. It's ramp up, ramp down, and that's basically it. So it starts from nothing, very quick ramp up, very quick ramp down, and kind of ends with nothing. The only slight real place where I think there's even any real discernible bitters happening here happens on the end after all of that ramp. There's the slightest just lingering sense of bitterness. We're talking minimal alpha acid extraction here. It's all been done for flavor and aroma and it's delicious, but uh, the hop head maybe would be craving more bitters as certainly I am, but I, I have really come to appreciate these sub styles. Are they what I would typically grab for my personal drinking pleasure on a daily basis? No, but do I always enjoy jumping into something new, trying something different, expanding my horizons? Absolutely I do. That's why I keep buying these. That's why I keep reviewing these. And you know, it it's a beer style that to me, I think is important. And for all of the things I talk when I'm passionately going on from my hop head side of the brain, I've got to say, the modern invention of this New England style IPA where brewers are exploring and creating these new things, it's bringing more people into the craft beer fold. It's a more accessible style. Humans are pre-programmed to dislike things that are bitter because in nature things that are bitter by and large are things that will kill you. So it's ingrained in our DNA that we taste bitter. Oh no, stay away from that, that's bad. And um, really, it takes time to appreciate that. The very first time I tried an IPA, and it was a very mild and tame one at that, um, I absolutely hated this style. I thought it was insanely bitter. I didn't touch them for years. I slowly started to get into the style when I got into bigger and heavier beers. The malt bills are naturally a little more bitter. Extra hops make it a little more bitter. And it was a slow progression. And I think that's how most people get into it. And it really came from my getting into coffee, um, very deep. I've always drunk coffee since I was very little, which is probably bad, but um, it was when I started drinking my coffee black, that's when I had my aha moment and said, wow, I really appreciate the sensation and flavor profile of bitter. You don't really get it anywhere else, but you get it in beers and it's absolutely delicious. So this is very much a quintessential, extremely delicious, extremely well done hazy IPA. It is packed full of aroma. It is packed full of layers of complex flavors that just weave in and out. It's just not very bitter forward. So for the sub style, the sub genre, it's exceptionally well executed. Um, finish may not be that long, but it's packed full of flavor. The body and the mouthfeel on this one are tremendous. The balance of what they did in this hazy is really, really great. Both of these hop varieties that are the stars of the show here are bringing all of their different elements and aspects to the table and they just absolutely work together in this beer beautifully. I'm gonna take my time sip on this one, come up my scores. When we come back, we will get to the second beer of today's review, totally different direction. This is called uh, Inner Earth from Dancing Gnome. It's an American Pale Ale that clocks in at 8% ABV. Okay, now jumping into the second beer of today's lighter hoppy beer review, we have got Dancing Gnomes Inner Earth. This is an American pale ale that clocks in at 8% ABV. Dancing Gnome is based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So another one of these where this is the first beer I've ever had by this brewer and um, a really great style. It's one of my favorites. 
Label art, very clean design, looks really cool. Just alternating shades of brown and green. I like it. Not much else to talk about there, so let's get this cracked gently. All right, pour it right in the old glass. Yet again, this is a pint can. It will not hold the whole thing. Okay, that is pouring a true pale ale, light straw, yellow color. It looks absolutely lovely. This beer is not having any problem at all, forming a really nice head as well. Visually, yeah, absolutely. That is textbook pale ale in terms of color. In terms of appearance, it's actually a little bit hazier, uh, a little bit more occluded than you would typically see, but it's not, uh, it's not like hazy IPA where it looks like a glass of juice. In terms of head, did a really great job here. Um, really nice, creamy, thick, foamy head on top. In terms of uh, carbonation, pretty active, as you would expect to see with the pale ale. Um, so jumping from one uh, kind of hazy IPA forward to the pale ale. This is an American pale ale. American pale ales tend, tend to be more hot dominant than their European counterparts. So I do actually expect that this is probably gonna have a little more bitter forward uh, palette to it than the hazy IPA we reviewed first. But that's gonna be part of the fun of the compare and contrast. Let's give it a sniff. Oh yeah, wow. I don't know what hops they put in there, but they smell fantastic. I'm getting tons of tropical fruit. I'm getting passion fruit, I'm getting pineapple, I'm getting guava, and I'm also getting a bunch of citrus. Uh, basically kind of orange and lemon combination there. Smells really, really nice, really, really fresh. So let's just uh, jump in, see what this one's about. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh yeah, wow. That is a really, really good American pale ale. Wow, okay. So as soon as I got in my mouth, started agitating around the palate, I knew my suspicion was correct. Indeed, this is very much more bitter forward than the hazy IPA we just reviewed. Um, I immediately, as I was agitating before I even swallowed, started picking up intense bitters and a ton of earthiness on the back. And uh, those flavors are quite, quite prevalent. In the mix of that, there is a subtle underlying um, kind of resinous quality and a subtle underlying um, kind of uh, citrus rind, citrus oil. So it's got that citrusy um, kind of flavor profile to it, but it's much more bitter intense. So it's much more like uh, you're zesting or taking the rind or, or extracting the oils from the rind. It's a lot more bitter forward. I, I can't stress enough just how impressively bitter forward this is. American pale ales tend to be uh, significantly more bitter forward than um, other interpretations of the style, but this one is very much so. I would say this is very high up on the list for in terms of uh, bitter forward nature. Um, they all tend to be very hop dominant, but this is specifically bitter dominant, and it's really, really delicious. So in terms of mouthfeel and body, um, the body feels pretty much exactly what I expected for a pale ale at 8%. Now that's a lot higher uh, average ABV than you would typically find on a pale ale. So you could almost make the argument it's into the India pale ale, typical uh, standard territory for modern American craft interpretations, except this one um, is just billing itself as a pale ale. So I think what they've done here is they added kind of the malt content you would typically find in an IPA, but they kept their hopping uh, traditional along the American pale ale side of things, if not a bit more intense than average, but not to their own personal IPA level. So this, I could kind of see it going either way. I could see people sipping on this saying, wow, that's a pale ale that's really hoppy dominant and really bitter forward for a pale ale. Yes, yes it is. But I appreciate what they did here and definitely it does have that more classically lighter straw pale yellow color to the malt bill. So I think that they probably did categorize it correctly. There's a fair bit of play in there. Um, brewers do get a brewer's license, but very, very nice beer. Mouthfeel on this one too, a little bit more resistance than your average uh, pale ale, but again, it's a higher ABV. So it, it feels breadth wise in the body and resistance wise in the mouthfeel, like it has a lot more in common with a standard IPA than your typical pale ale. I don't wanna say a pale ale is typically flat by comparison, but they don't have quite that same intensity of breadth of body or mouthfeel. 
but it's very, very nice. I'm gonna jump in, um, pick up a bit more on flavor development here and see how this finishes out. Mm. That flavor palette really intensifies on second sip. So, one thing of note, agitating around the palate, this one does get quite creamy, even thicker still. In terms of flavor development, everything I got on the first sip, I got again on the second sip, it's just intensified. But I did pick up an additional couple notes. There's a little bit of a grassiness to it on the back and a little bit of lemongrass, distinctly different flavors, but it all comes through very well. So it's intensely bitter, intensely earthy, got the citrusy side to it, slight bits of tropical fruit to it, some grassiness, some underlying earthiness, and lemon grassiness, which is a distinctly different flavor. It's a great brewing ingredient. It's a great cooking ingredient. Overall, this is an absolutely, absolutely delicious beer. This is a very, very well done American pale ale. And frankly, it's quite, uh, quite a treat. I'm a big fan. I don't get enough pale ales in my life, and this one is exceptional. In terms of how the finish ends, the finish is quite a bit longer than your standard pale ale. For an American even, it's a good bit longer. Like I said, this is very hop forward, very hop dominant, very bitter forward and bitter dominant. And that really, just as with any very hoppy and bitter forward IPA, extend the length of the finish on this one significantly. Um, even 30 seconds after each sip, there is a lingering uh, earthy bitters and uh, kind of citrus bitters all on the back. Overall, I am a big, big fan of this beer. Truly delicious. I'm going to take my time sip on this, comb my scores. When we come back, we will get both beers ranked from top to bottom. Okay, now that we've gotten to enjoy both beers, we're going to get them ranked, starting with Beer Brewery or Company's Deadly Combination. This is part of their Two Hop Rotating IPA series. Uh, this specific one was brewed with Mosaic and Strata Hops, clocks in at 7.4% ABV. Barrier Brewing Company is based in Oceanside, New York. So, as one might expect with a hazy IPA, this beer was incredibly aromatic. Um, there's always a lot of dry hopping involved. It uh, kind of goes hand in hand with the style and the aromas are just unbelievable. You can really pick up all the subtleties of the hops that go into the beer style. This was no exception. It was absolutely top tier for the sub style, 10 out of 10. For the taste, I absolutely loved it. Um, look, do I prefer hoppier uh, IPAs? Yes, I prefer West Coast styles. Uh, more classic styles, hop forward and less focused on the aromas and more uh, about bringing out the bitters. This sub style does that sometimes, but it's not the norm. This followed the normal path of hugely aromatic, focusing more on the intrinsic separate flavors that are brought to the table, all the complexities that are in the flavor profile of the hop itself, while keeping the bitters dialed back. Does that make it any less tasty? Not at all. In fact, this was multi, multi-faceted, multi-tiered, tons of different layers of uh, earthiness and fruitiness and berry-like and tropical and citrus and um, very limited bitters. But the flavors that came through were truly, truly fantastic and they really did a great job of drawing all of those out of both of the hop varieties. I give the taste a 10 out of 10. For the body, this was very much a textbook IPA for this ABV range. The body does get a perfect 10 out of 10. For the mouthfeel, uh, essentially the same thing. IPAs are normally very consistent. It's rare that there's one that feels really less weighty or significantly more weighty or more or less viscous. Um, they tend to be quite consistent. This certainly fit that bill as well. The mouthfeel, exactly as expected. It gets a 10 out of 10. For the finish, this is one of the categories where hazies, um, unless they're particularly bitter forward, which is the exception than the rule, uh, they tend to fall a little flatter in the scheme of what an IPA really is and what it can be. And it's not always the case because some that aren't super bitter forward have quite long and uh, well in the realm of an IPA expected finish. So what was the finish on this one like? Well, it was certainly uh, in terms of the way that it felt with its very wet and round nature to the end, uh, very much classic IPA. Uh, where it didn't do as well was just flatly in terms of length of finish. 
This was average, high end of average, but just average. It gets a six out of 10. For the head and retention, this one did an absolutely tremendous job. Wonderful, thick, creamy, lush head that stuck around the entire time. It does get a 10 out of 10. For the appearance, exactly as expected. Classic IPA yellow with that nice, beautiful haze. Gets a perfect 10 out of 10. For the balance, the balance on this beer, um, this is one of my sticking points, uh, really with the substyle. And it's, it's only as I've had, oh, so, so many hazies in New England styles uh, in the last year and a half, two years here, that have really come to fine tune my expectation. So the balance in terms of how they built it was exceptional. Yes, it was hop forward, but the problem with this beer was a noticeable almost absence of bitters. Just because it's hazy, just because it's uh, accentuating all these underlying hop trait characteristics does not mean that it should be absent or can't have some bittering agents. It was there, yes, technically, but so subtle. I mean, your average Pilsner was far more bitter forward than this beer. If we took an average Pilsner's bittering profile, the IBUs, and stuck it into this beer, would that have detracted from all of the uh, amazing nuances that the hop bring flavor-wise characteristic to the table? Not at all. It would have added an added dimension and been much more in align with the classic IPA style at any rate. So yes, um, what I got was absolutely delicious, but did I think the balance was off? Yes, I did. Um, I've had uh, beers in this category all over the board. This one I thought fit squarely in the middle. It does get a five out of 10. Filling in the intangible, subjectively. I've come to appreciate what the sub style is, uh, but do I think that this was upper echelon of what a hazy IP is, AP is? No. Um, this one, again, fell squarely average for me. It gets a five out of 10. Finally, as an example of the style. Subjectivity aside and the relative balance and Vanish issues aside, most every other category this beer did exceptionally well uh, and top tier at that. So overall, it really does balance out to be a well above average uh, hazy IPA. I think the average hazy IPA drinker, people that actively seek those out would really, really appreciate this. Uh, this is not one that I think a diehard, a bitter forward hop head would um, hate but certainly they would probably be wishing there were more bitters present. I kind of felt the same way. In the grand scheme of things, it is above average for the style. It does get a seven out of 10, which brings the total score and Barrier Brewing Company's deadly combination, Mosaic and Strata Hop version, to an 83 out of 100. So this is indeed well above average. Um, this is one of those beer styles that it suits specific type of taste. It's not for everybody, just as a West Coast, Hugely bitter forward and resinous IPA is not for everybody. That's a beautiful thing about having options and I'm all for it. Moving on to beer number two. Uh, first beer from this brewer. This is Dancing Gnomes Inner Earth, an American pale ale that clocked in at 8% ABV. They are based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Starting with the aroma. The aroma on this one was quite, quite pungent. Uh, significantly more pungent than your average American pale ale, uh, really hop dominant. You could smell that quite clearly. It smelled absolutely delicious. A lot of what I got reminding me of an IPA. Aroma gets a nine out of 10. For the taste, I got far more than I anticipated. Um, American pale ales tend to, be, tend to be significantly more bitter forward than their European and other global counterparts. Um, and let's, let's be honest here, a pale ale is the less hop centric, less hopped, lighter version of an IPA. This was quite a bit different. This was a unique beer in this segment. Quite a bit higher uh, ABV than your average pale ale. Indeed, this is higher than even the average IPA at 8%. That's really high for a pale ale. They could have almost called it an imperial pale ale and I wouldn't have batted an eye. Um, so in terms of the flavor, massively, massively hop forward. A beautiful underlying malt bill that was a great backbone, but the hop flavor profiles were so intense and multi-layered and just a boatload of bitters. I was really shocked, even more bitter forward than your average American pale ale. I absolutely love this one. The taste, very complex. I loved it. It gets a 10 out of 10. For the body, the body had a ton of breadth to it, much higher than your average pale ale, but higher ABV, so I gave it 10 out of 10. Mouthfeel, same story here. Ton of resistance, ton of creaminess when you agitate it around the palate. Mouthfeel gets a 10 out of 10. For the finish, 
finish significantly longer than your average American pale ale, uh, indeed than any pale ale, American or otherwise. And it was really just that absolute intensity of hops, that hop dominance this beer had. And the bitters really, really helped the cause here. Finish, very long, it gets a nine out of 10. Head and retention, just as with the first one, this one did absolutely textbook, picture perfect, it gets a 10 out of 10. For the appearance, classic light straw, pale yellow color, that's textbook pale ale, it gets a 10 out of 10. For the balance, the balance, I would not have changed a thing. That malt bill was the backbone. It did its job. You could taste the multi characteristics, but it let the hops be the star of the show. They were at the forefront, even with more intensity than your average pale ale. And I thought it was a very nice take. And with that higher ABV, I really, really liked what they're doing with this one and what they brought to the table. Balance, perfect 10 out of 10. Feeling in the intangible, one of the best pale ales I've ever had, hands down. It gets a 10 out of 10. Finally, as an example of the style, this beer barely lost points. One in aroma, one in finish. It does get that perfect 10 out of 10, for example, of the style, which brings the total score on Dancing Gnomes Inner Earth to a 98 of 100. Frankly, for my money, that's about as good as a pale ale gets. Um, maybe I've had one I scored higher, but I would really have to research my notes and rack my brain. That was essentially pale ale perfection. So we got to kind of compare and contrast a couple different angles of what these hot forward beers are about. Hazy's are all about the flavor and the aromatics, less bitter focused. Pale Ales, this was really an amped up version. So we got to see two different sides of the same coin. And I thought that they compared and contrast very well and really gave uh, maybe a bit more clarity as to what there is out in the marketplace, what to expect. Certainly different beers for different people's personal tastes, but that's the world of craft beer and it's part of what makes it fun. Folks, that's today's review. As always, I do sincerely appreciate you tuning in today. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It really does help the channel. And if you wanna stay in the loop when our videos go live to YouTube, just click the notification bell icon. It is right next to the subscribe button. Until next time, keep it beer, keep it craft. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers.